our first story tonight, I Get a Kick Out of You. And the kids in the audience may not know the reference, but the older folks in the audience definitely recognize the reference from the song. Uh, you probably don't know where I'm leading, I'm gonna take this, do you? But we're gonna start with the solar system, with the sun and the eight planets pictured here. And I will add as a side note, this is not the real point of the story, that there was things about ninth planets this month. Um, a group of astronomers tried to uh, put together a drive to get Pluto reinstated as, as a planet. Um, and the rest of the astronomers go, nah, no thank you. Um, and there also is a scientific prediction that there is another ninth planet way outside the solar system. And one of the cool things that they just did is they did a citizen science project to analyze a lot of data, and they came up with four possible candidates. All right, this is news that just came out in the last couple of days. So there may actually be a, uh, I believe it's a, a, a Neptune-sized planet way out there. Um, there's a little bit, there's some, there's some evidence based on orbits that indicates that it might be out there. Um, we just had a talk here a few weeks ago by Mike Brown, who is the one who's leading the search for this. Um, and we'll see. So there, you know, the number of planets in the solar system, um, as always, is going to be maybe in flux again. But regardless of how many planets you think should be or shouldn't be in the solar system, we can agree on one thing. There is exactly one star in the solar system, okay? We have one star, the sun, in the center of the solar system. And you might think that that's typical, but it's not. Most stars are actually in multiple star systems. All right? Half the stars you see in the night sky are binary or multiple star systems, which means that about two-thirds of the stars are in multiple star systems. So for example, the North Star is called Polaris. Here is the North Star at the, um, at the handle of the Little Dipper, and you hear the pointer stars of the Big Dipper that point to the North Star, Polaris. Polaris is a double star that is Polaris A, and Polaris B when you, uh, when you look at it closely. And if you look at Polaris A even closer, you find that Polaris A is actually a double star itself, Polaris A and Polaris AB, all right? So these stars are in multiple systems. And there are three stars in this in, uh, that are gravitationally bound here. And it's a stable system because Polaris A and Polaris AB are a tight binary. They're in real close. And then Polaris B is sort of a wide binary long far further away. Now, you know the saying that two's company and three's a crowd? Well, that's also true in gravitational systems. So if Polaris B were in close with Polaris A and Polaris AB, right, then the gravitational interactions of three objects in a tight binary would likely lead to one of them being ejected. Gravitational interactions that would tighten up a binary and kick out one of the stars. The point is, is that gravitational interactions among multiple star systems can dissolve the star system by sending off the stars, by s kicking the stars out of the gravitational system. All right, where's this gonna lead us? It is going to lead us to the Orion Nebula. This is the central region of the Orion Nebula. Here are the trapezium stars. We're not gonna talk about those today. Instead, we're gonna talk about this region up here. It's the Kleinman Low region, or just the KL region within the Orion Nebula. And if I zoom into it, within the KL region, we had previously known about two what we call high-velocity stars, stars that are moving at significantly speeds across the night sky. And one of them was called BN, and I forget what that stands for, it's somebody's name or something like that. And the other one was called I, and you can't really see it in this Hubble image because it only shows up in, at deeper infrared wavelengths, okay? And so they ha saw that BN and I were moving across the sky, and they had reasoned that about 500 years ago they were together, and they're now flying apart from each other. However, when they did the momentum calculations, they found out that it doesn't work, that there isn't enough mass split, the mass split between the two isn't even, that the, the mathematics of it doesn't work out that you could really, yet that you could send them off in those directions at those speeds with those masses and have a conservation of momentum. So they were expecting that there has to be another component to this system. 
Well, they were doing another Hubble study looking for free-floating planets in the Orion Nebula. And they were comparing images from 1998 with those of 2015. And in doing so, they noticed this star here called X. They call it Source X. And when they looked at the two, two epochs, they found that Source X had a significant difference between 1998 and 2015. They then calculated that backwards to see where it was long ago, and lo and behold, source X, source I, and source BN were all around that initial position about 540 years ago. So they have found the third component, and when they do the mathematics now, they can get conservation momentum, um, and so that all three of them could have been part of a, a single system that broke apart 540 years ago, around 1470. They said uh, during the time of the War of the Roses. All right? So these three stars got a gravitational kick out of each other uh, about 500 years ago. All right. Our second story tonight, Supernova Survivor. We will be talking about Type 1A supernovae. All right, now these are supernovae that come from the explosion of a white dwarf. A white dwarf is a stellar remnant. It's basically a giant atom, okay? It's supported by something called electron degeneracy pressure. It, it's all, the star has burned out and it's, it's collapsed in and the, the pressure of electron orbitals pressing against one another is actually holding this star up. It's like a giant atom about the size of Earth but weighing about the mass of the sun, okay? Um, and if you add the, in order to make it explode, you have to accrete mass onto it. You have to add more mass until it exceeds what's called the Chandrasekhar limit, all right, about 1.4 solar masses. Because at 1.4 solar masses, the electron degeneracy pressure cannot withstand the gravitational force and it collapses in upon itself and then explodes, all right? And because this is a white dwarf explosion is always going to occur at this mass, well, that supernova explosion will have a standard brightness and have a standard light curve, and they're an extremely important type of supernova for us gauging the brightness of it and therefore the distance to it, and it's useful for all sorts of purposes. It actually was instrumental in the discovery of uh, dark energy and the accelerating universe, okay? So understanding them is important. And there, were two, there are two hypotheses as to what causes the uh, white dwarf to go over 1.4 solar masses. First one is the binary white dwarf merger. You have two white dwarfs that are in orbit around each other. They spiral in, merge together. The total mass goes over the Chandrasekhar limit, and you get an explosion. We're not going to talk about that tonight. We're going to talk about the other hypothesis, which is called a cataclysmic binary system. I just love that name, cataclysmic binaries. Um, and what that is, is you have a white dwarf star here, and you have a red giant or a red supergiant that is bloated up, and the material streams off of the red giant onto the white dwarf and accretes onto the white dwarf, pushing it over the Chandrasekhar limit. So the question is, what happens when that white dwarf explodes as a supernova, what happens to the red, uh, the red giant or the red supergiant? Okay? Well, actually, we believe it survives. We believe that the star actually survives. I mean, of course, its outer layers are going to get blown away, but the star will survive. So we've been looking for evidence and have found what we believe are evidence of the binary star in these type 1a supernovae. The second star, and it's the first star, of course, blow itself to bits. So our image that we released uh, just recently is this one, a nice, beautiful image, uh, featuring the supernova remnant N103b. Okay? Uh, this is in the Large Magellanic Cloud, a satellite galaxy of the Milky Way, about 170,000 light years away. Now, the supernova remnant isn't the whole image. It's actually just this region up here. Uh, this region down here is not part of the supernova remnant. That's actually part of the star cluster NGC 1850, but it's still so beautiful we wanted to include it in the image. 
All right, so if we close in on the supernova remnant N103b, here is the guts of the star that were blown out into space by that supernova explosion. And they have been searching this field, trying to find the, per, the uh, companion star to the type 1a supernova. They found a yellow dwarf star, very much like our own sun, that they believe is that binary companion to the white dwarf that exploded. They do not have definitive proof yet. All right, the, um, they do not ha ha have, a, have, have the smoking gun that says this truly truly is, but they, um, are, are they, they have a scientific paper out arguing why it could be, um, and more research will help figure it out. And as I said, um, the star cluster NGC 1850 in the lower corner um, is also really cool. You can see there's a lot of resolution in this image to see uh, uh, all, the, all the great details. So even though we didn't have a definitive science result, we sort of released this also as just a really gorgeous picture of stars and nebulae in the universe, one of the pretty pictures that we often release from Hubble to show you just how wonderful the universe really is. All right, and so we may actually have a survivor of a supernova existing up here in that remnant. Question. If you had a supernova and there was a planet with life, how far from that supernova would the planet with life have to be to survive? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and um, the estimates have ranged from uh, 1,000 light years to 10,000 light years that I've seen, um, simply because the, um, the energy put out by the supernova ca can be, can, yeah, well, not, not fry everything, but, but can disrupt the uh, atmospheres, et cetera, uh, and such. So um, I really don't know the, the definitive answer. I remember somebody giving a talk and discussing that here, but um, I can't remember. So certainly if it were you know, 10 or 20 light years away, it would be a problem. Uh, 100 light years would, would probably be a problem. Um, I think that if it's 1,000 light years, you might, uh, that's where we start to get into the safe, uh, we're def definitely the safe zone. Uh, but where in there that it happens, it also depends upon what uh, energetics you're considering and um, uh, about it especially. Okay, and stars are there within 1,000 light years? Stars within 1,000 light years, okay. There's about one star per cubic parsec. Um, uh, I know I'm talking parsecs, which is three light years, but you know, 1,000 light years uh, is, is, is what? 300. Yeah, 300. So, yeah, there are hundreds of stars within 1,000 light years. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, question in the back. Just a general question about the Hubble. <laughs> <laughs> I've read about the magnificent optics and the fantastic instrumentation. What about just the basic pointing apparatus? Are there little <laughs> rockets? Okay. So the question was, how does Hubble point? How does Hubble point? It uses uh, reaction wheels and gyroscopes. Um, the reaction wheels, as if you spin a wheel in one direction, the telescope turns in the other direction. So there are reaction wheels on Hubble that, uh, that, allow it to, that allow it to turn and point. And we have the fine guidance sensors um, and the gyroscopes to, to lock onto a star and have updates m many times a second to keep it on the star. Thank you. Yes, right here. About what distance is it between Polaris A and Polaris B? Ah, the distance between Polaris A and B, I did not remember that from my reading this afternoon. Um, usually these uh, binary systems um, can be anything from um, order of like Earth-Jupiter, uh, Sun-Jupiter distances, which is a few AU, on up to about 100, 200 AU. Okay, so there's solar system stops, uh, uh, type distances. If you get too far, too far beyond a few hundred AU, um, then uh, the, um, well, if you get to thousands of AU, certainly you can get uh, the, uh, the tidal effects of passing stars to destroy, <coughs> the, to destroy the systems. Okay, good question. All right, I can't answer too many questions because we've got we to gotta, we gotta get to our speaker, but one more question, then I'll go. Do Polaris A and B orbit around one another, or are they, they just... Yes, uh, so, so Polaris A, so the question was what the, describe the orbits of, of the system. Polaris A and Polaris AB are in a tight binary system. Okay? These two and Polaris B are in a wide binary system. So you got spinning here and then you got the overall thing. Okay? That's, that's, how, that, that, that's how we look at These are a tight binary and this is a, a wide binary. It ends up being a total, total being a triple system.